jeans are actually a bit more friendly, but I haven't got jeans on, unfortunately. Um, but I'm, I'm Dan White, mainly um, Emergency Medicine Consultant in Derby. I know a few of you through working in these Midlands as a trainee a few years ago. And the topic I'm going to try and cover is teaching the whole department. What can we do to actually teach every aspect of our emergency department? And I'll be breaking no kind of barriers. There'll be no massive things that you'll learn new, but I'm trying to pull together all the stuff that we're doing in Derby and the little pockets of practice that, help, that are happening across the country. And can we, hopefully, as a result of today, try and teach the whole department better? And I'll try and cover that in the next 15, 20 minutes. And actually, a lot of, it's interesting, I've not talked to Scott about his presentation, but a lot of what he's actually alluded to that comes up in my presentation today. And the last word of that, you know, that quote is really important, that inspiring word. And um, one of the consultants, Ed Hartley, here in Coventry, has done an audit recently looking at why people have come into emergency medicine, what's made them choose our specialty. And what, what he found, he actually went down to the nitty gritty of naming names of who are the people that have, have inspired and led them to go down the route of emergency medicine. And when you look through the names of those people, it's because they're teachers and because they're educators, without, almost without exception. So if we can leave today being inspiring and being inspired, we've done a, a good job at the email. So I'm going to cover a bit of background to the the importance of teaching the whole emergency department. I'm going to talk about that from the perspective of Derby. And I'm going to, you know, we are we are breaking no we're breaking no boundaries, there's no barriers, but certainly there's things we're doing which I think we can share and hopefully do better. And I'll cover what we're trying to teach, who we're trying to teach, some of the challenges we've ha we've had around teaching all of the emergency department, and maybe a few little nuances and things we're doing which hopefully we can share and maybe you might want to bring into your own practice and your own department. And for me, the big plea is let's learn from each other. I think we're all in our own individual silos. We're chipping away, trying to break barriers and, 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 and chip through the granite wall of emergency medicine. And if we just share a bit better and share some of the work we're doing, we'll all, you know, we can work together and be better. And then I'll put it all together and conclude. So there is no silver bullet. We can't, there is no one thing that will make everything better. And this is one department, just at, you know, our department in Derby, and I'll try and share what we're doing. But there's other stuff that's going on across the country, which I've alluded to already. So the number one thing, and the thing I think we do, we do quite well, is we value the people that we work with. And if you teach, if you educate, if you support the people that work with you, you that will help your retention and your recruitment of staff. And that's what we want to do. And if we can help, if we can educate, we can teach, and we can help our recruitment and retention, we will give better quality of care. I'm looking to have the co our college tutor here from, from Derby, and, and one of the things that we in the East Midlands are pushing quite hard, and what's become the remit now to college tutor, is not just medical teaching, but it's, <coughs> it's whole departmental teaching. And the college tutor is now responsible for whole pan departmental teaching, which makes the role of a senior medic in education very, very important, not just, not just for the medics, but for the 90 nursing staff that we have the health cares we have, the ACPs, the EMPs. So we have a big responsibility to make sure that we teach all aspects of our department. And how do we get the balance? How do we get the balance between service commitment and education? We have huge numbers of patients coming through the door. We have challenges with staffing and recruitment and retention. How do we <coughs> ensure that we continue to commit to provide education for all the people that come in, that are working <coughs> in our department, giving fantastic quality of care? And that balance is very, very difficult. So a bit of background, we are 120,000 patients a, a year in the top kind of 30 biggest attendances, so we're a large DGH. And as a result of that, we have clear challenges of ensuring that we get that balance between service commitment and education and teaching. And we do have a reputation within the region for providing good teaching and, and, and quality of teaching, but we have to make sure that continues. And it's all about to have reputation, but you must ensure that we maintain that, and that's our challenge, our big challenge. I wrote this down, it, quite, it actually frightened me, and I wrote down the numbers of people that we have in each different aspect of our department, and how do we provide education for all those different groups. And the total was nearly 200 people. 13 consultants, two associate specialists. We left enough to have 25 middle grade doctors, 16 junior doctors, 12 ACPs, 15 EMPs, 90 whole time equivalent nurses, and 20 healthcare. And across all of all of those, we are looking at how we can educate all those different groups of people. And that's a, a responsibility and challenge that we're taking on board, but it's, it's, a, it's tough. 
I can't look out for challenges like the guy riding his bike or the children trying to beat him, but either way, it's certainly a challenge, him riding his bike. Like it is a challenge for us in our emergency department to make sure we educate and train all those people that I've talked about. How do we meet their individual needs, their collective needs? How do we meet their expectations? And how do we ensure that we sustain that, that while managing our clinical commitments as well? And that sustainability is really, really important. So I broke it into medical education, nurse education, allied kind of EMP and ACP education, and then a bit around the nuances of what we try to do. So consultant education, I'm sure we were all doing bits of consultant education. In Derby we do, we have about every 10 days, two weeks, we have a consultant meeting, and we try and ensure that we have education at the end of that consultant meeting. That may be externally led by, we've had ophthalmology recently, renal recently, but it's protected time. That's important for two reasons. Number one, we continue learning and trying to educate ourselves. And number two, it gives us as a, as a consultant body time both to have our meeting, but also to learn as a group and bounce ideas off each other. And that's really, really important. I've alluded to our middle grade tier, and our middle grade tier is probably different from other departments, and I'll cover that slightly now. But we have two different tiers within our middle grade department. We have the, the traditional trainees who are making their way through the traditional ST1 to 6, an emergency medicine consultant through a CCT, and they all get daily, um, their monthly teaching, release from commitments, they get you know, um, FCAM type um, training and support, and we provide a road to them and ensure they can attend all of their teaching. And they're our number one priority. They're the people we want to get through that we, if we provide the right support and training, will become our consultants of the future. But the group below are a group that we've worked very hard with over the, over the past few years, and we've, we've gone from four to 21 SAS, so non-training grade doctors, by essentially offering secondment education, support and training. And we offer anaesthetics and ITU and acute <coughs> medicine and paediatrics. But a big, and we've managed to convert huge numbers of people from locum contracts to trust contracts. And we've done that by promising education and training. And it's amazing what you can do if you promise education and training and you commit to it and you actually provide it, people will, are less bothered about the money and they're actually, they, will commit to, they will commit to having education as their fundamental principle for being a medic. And if we can capitalise on that and offer this group of doctors education and training, we have a whole unsourced um, workforce out there that we can provide training for. And what we're trying to do at Derby is trying to help them through the to a season, through the seas of the old Article 14 to be consultants of the future. So we offer four hours of protected time every two weeks where they will get teaching, which is blocked from their, from their rotary and from their, from their contract. And that's led by Dave, our college tutor, but we have middle grades who actually facilitate and do their teaching. And we've got and we have middle grades who would be reading The Sun and The Daily Mirror during their lunch break who are now reading EMJs and BMJs. So there's a massive change in their, their outlook and, and, how they're, and how they're, where they're working towards, which is really important. I was going to say porn, but I thought I'd better not because it's on the video. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to read all that, but we have the F1, F2s, we have GP, BTS, we have ST3s, and we provide a road to an education for all of those groups for that group and make sure they're protected time with their writing. And we have med students, we all have med students. We talk to Pete, who's our med student lead, we have huge numbers of med students, all the way from first clinical attachment ever to post-graduation. And we have a combination of teaching fellows, clinical educators and consultants who <coughs> deliver, deliver their teaching. So we try to have protected, you know, dedicated people providing teaching to the med students because they are our doctors of the future. And if we can get people into emergency medicine early, when they're first, you know, when they're first as med students, we will have a, you know, a more sustainable workforce further down the line. So we have a number of teaching fellows who are at middle grade level, kind of peri MCM type level. We have nurse, um, sort of experienced nurses who provide clinical education for the for the um, med students, and we have all of us are doing med student teaching, but we have SIFT funding for the consultant group as well. So. We work very, very hard with the med students as part of one of our roles. So what about nursing education, particularly ACPs and the EMPs, first of all? We've got, we've got 12 ACPs, of which three are trainees, and which nine are trained ACPs. And we give them protected time with SPA time to ensure they can develop themselves. We provide dedicated time for the ACPs. But they're a, you know, they're a, they're a challenging group. They have their own um, sort of expectations of education, they have their own 
they've risen to the top of their own field within nursing London. So we have to make sure we provide and we back up what we're going to say and we make sure that we do it as well. We've worked very hard with the University at Derby to ensure that we now have, we now train our own ACPs and we now have up to about 40 ACPs in the trust and we're hoping to employ and train more and more. But there are, it's one parallel of a number of options for workforce and whatever you decide to do for workforce, you've got to make sure that the backbone of that is education and training. Same for the EMPs, their protected time for study day. <coughs> we're doing certain bits around head injuries and eyes, for example, where we're extending their roles and providing consultant supervision and support to make sure they get to where they want to get to and extend their skills as they want to extend their skills. And this has been the challenge, and I'd love to hear what people think about how we can make nurse education better. And we've, I've been employed in Derby Consultant for nearly four years, and I tried my first sort of year and a half to get nurse education going on my own, and it was almost impossible. And I'd love to hear what people are trying to do around nurse education. And it might be that we put it down, left it with the matron or with whatever kind of managerial kind of responsibility and roles you have. But I think there's a massive bit we can put in from a medical point of view to provide nurse education for this group. We have one whole time equivalent who's a designated nurse educator. There's a breakfast club that's been reinstigated, which was early part of March, where we, we try and catch between the night staff finishing and the day staff starting, but they're doing 12 hour shifts. So the implementation and the uptake and the, the kind of desire for teaching at nurse level is quite, is quite difficult to actually implement. And there's huge numbers of people. So we've got some ideas, but we'd, I'd love to hear what people are doing and how best we can try and support that group because I think we'd all agree that retention of our nursing staff is really, really important and how can we help from a medical perspective to educate that group. There's some specific things we're doing. We provide, and I'll go through that from a support point of view, from an education point of view, and then with regard to being exam, exam specific. So we have dedicated work-based assessment clinics and we have consultant time where we will give um, blocked out time for both the trainees and the SAS doctors. And that might be for CBDs, for mini cactus, for dots, because I'm out, I'm with my Rita, I have my Rita, and I had to get nine CBDs. And I remember on the day running around trying to get these bits of paperwork, and it was a nightmare. And actually, to provide some time for them off the, you know, off, off the shop floor, protected time gives them that peace of mind that they will get they will get the relevant bits of paperwork done. So we've worked hard on that, and that's something which we continue to to work hard to do. They all get a budget, a £1,000 budget for all trust employed doctors, which helps with courses and training and everything they want to do. And they get four hours of SPA CPD time per week, which I think is vitally important. So one of my other colleagues here is, is Pete, he's simulation lead, not just, for the not just for the department, but also for the trust. And education wise, as well as within our department, we try to get the department as good as we can, and then to actually have influence at a wider level an influence at trust level and at, at, at divisional level and, and various levels to, to try and sell what we're doing at a bit at wider level. And from a simulation point of view, we've done a lot within the department and now we're trying to ensure that gets actually rolled out across the trust. So we have both in situ sim and we have <coughs> fidelity sim. And in situ sim, run by the middle grade, one of our middle grade doctors, he will come and will phone an alert through on the, on the alert phone, but it will be a simulated patient. And so we'll simulate regularly on the shop floor with the nursing staff, the healthcare as a consultant, the middle grade. So we have a whole MDT in situ simulation with then some dedicated feedback afterwards. And that helps to bring the team together, help team working, help camaraderie, everything else, which <coughs> has been a really, really good introduction to our department. And then we're lucky enough in Derby to have high fidelity simulation where we have um, very you know, good regular access to simulation and we're teaching at all levels from med student up to consultant. Exam specific, I'm the Chris proposal lead for the East Midlands, so we provide regional teaching, 10, 10 sessions twice a year leading up to the ECAM exam. We do one of our consultants does specific management teaching for within the region, so we encourage trainees to come to Derby to get some management teaching before the ECAM. Another of our consultants is TPD for the ACCF. So we're trying to influence regionally and just support the doctors both locally and regionally. And this, I think, is what Scott alluded to earlier, is really, really important. <coughs> you can't, there is no one person that's done it. We, we are trying as a group, and we have you know, 12, 13 of us, but actually we all are passionate about education. We all work together with education. One, two, or three people is not enough. It's got to be 
the core body of your team that are passionate about education for it to work. That's really, really important. We have a very, very good college tutor who's here today, but I won't embarrass him, who's pushed things forward massively. And as part of that, we have an education task and finish group. And we have representatives from the doctor, the nursing staff, the health, you know, health cares, EMP. So we have a range of people that are coming to that meeting to ensure that we can work out what their needs are and then work towards those needs. <coughs> then we have a range of competencies which we've set up both for nursing staff and the ACP. So we have a framework, both governance and education, which will help guide us as to where we need to be teaching them and what they want to learn. And that's the most important bit. If you don't value the workforce you have, you, 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 you know, you're not going to work. It's a failing department. So you must, we must all value the people that work with us. That's really important. So nothing, well, no, that's not true, but <coughs> virtually nothing is impossible, but you've just got to work out how, how, what are the ways around it to make it better. I can't, none of us can yet work out how to really crack nurse education. There are, as I said, a large group of practitioners. To get that balance right between service provision, and engagement is really, really challenging. And how do we do that? I don't, I don't know. I'd love to hear some advice. That'd be very helpful. How do we make sure it's sustainable? That's really, really important. And we're all, we talked about it last night, a few of us, and, and we're all carrying on the clinical work and we're doing the education. How do we ensure that we keep that sustainable? That's really, that's our biggest challenge, I think. And that comes back to clinical versus non-clinical com commitments. And we try and ensure we keep the clinical, that's our job. Our job is patient care and to give high quality patient care. But we also have to educate and train to make sure the doctors of the future and the EMPs of the future and the ACPs of the future are going to better give good quality care as well. And that balance is quite difficult to juggle. And this is my, my plea, I think one of my main, my main passions is we're working too much in individual silos. We're working too much within our individuals, within our each department, and how can we work out ways of sharing what we're doing. And a forum such as today with EMEC is a really, really good starting point to share that work that we're doing and try and help each other to be better educationists for the future. So it's something we should all be aspiring to, to achieve. We should all be working to achieve teaching the whole department. That should be one of our aims. And there's benefits from staff morale, for well-being, for recruitment and retention. But it requires huge amounts of shared thinking, shared working, working together. And there's got to be a motivation and a passion to make sure that it happens. Yeah.